So what we're going to be talking about today, along with getting to know them, is they're going to give us some insights into what they've written, why they've written it, and their writing process. So I think, um, because I'm a great believer in tradition, and we're going to start on Tarant, what I'd like you to do is tell us your name, the book you're nominated for, what, uh, in a two or three sentence description of the book, so the audience just knows what we're talking about, and then we'll come back to motivations, techniques, and that kind of thing afterwards. So, oh, you're on. All right, this should be fun. I was nominated for three. Um, first, first year, I was nominated for Best Horror. The novel was Honor at Stake. It was my version of, let's take everything good about Dracula and then have it make sense because I'm a Catholic philosophy major and I just thought it would be fun. Apparently a lot of other people thought so too. Second year, I was nominated twice, once for book three uh, in the Love at First Bite series. Uh, it was called Live and Let Bite because I'm subtle. Um, it was also nominated for Best Horror. Uh, I was also nominated for Best Apocalypse. Uh, which I believe is now completely wiped out for... Yes, really? <laughs> which was, uh, the book was Codename Unsub, which was a simple, straightforward dystopia, and then I added a serial killer. Thank and you. I think that's funny. Yeah. Uh, by the way, an explanation on what he said there, all the categories are not locked on the dragon rules. You follow what is going on in the market. You move Hi, my name is Vera Nazarian, and uh, I was nominated this year uh, in the Best Science Fiction Novel category for my book called Win. And this is actually book three of a series uh, of four books. Um, it's called The Atlantis Grail. And this series is actually, um, it's, it's a more, mostly a crossover, um, kind of a crossover thriller. And the best way to describe it would be to say, the Hunger Games meets Ancient Aliens, meets Divergent, meets Heinlein, and probably Ender's Game. If you can put all of that together, <laughs> you have an idea. It's basically an, an asteroid coming to hit Earth, and aliens arrive who happen to be the descendants of Ancient Atlantis, and they're there to save us. And what happens next? Hi, I'm R.R. Birdie, and I was nominated in 2016 and 2017 for Best Fantasy Paranormal. Uh, the first book was Great Measures, which is book two from The Great Report, which is essentially quantum leap meets Dresden Files. Uh, if Dresden couldn't throw a magic and he had to body on and it's all other people's murders. And the second novel was Dangerous Waste for last year, which is Highland and Neverwhere. So, Coral Fantasy with uh, Ageless Immortal who has used Civil War guns from Weapon Green because he likes it to fight fairies. My name is Jonathan Brazy. I was nominated this year for my first an integration, which is the first book in my Ghost Marines from the series. You can tell it's probably Space Marines, but this one was dedicated to the Montfort Point Marines, which were the first African-American Marines to serve in the U.S. Marine Corps. And it's hurrah. And it's my, uh, it, it's both a salute to them and it's an uh, exploration of integrating a military service, in this case, a future Marine Corps. Hi, my name is Marlena Fante. I was a nominee in the apocalyptic category uh, in 2016 for my novel Tears and Freedom.
This is the free waffle line. Waffle line, you want Now, military sci fi has been thinking of the nominated for that once, but my first nomination was The Time to Die, Zombie Apocalypse in 2016. My second nomination was uh, the first of the Four Horsemen Universe was Cartwright's Cavaliers in 2017, and this year was my third nomination, which was uh, Time to Run, the sequel to my first nomination, Time to Die. And this is a book. Mark's is in the change point. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Mark's problem is he keeps going, he keeps going up against Stephen King. <laughs> um, now, we're in Korea. I, uh, won, I won Best Fantasy the uh, first year of the Dragon Awards for the novel Son of the Black Sword, which is a uh, epic fantasy series based in the world that's uh, loosely based upon uh, India. And I have a lot of fun with that. And then last year, um, I won Best Fantasy for uh, Monster Hunter Grunge that I did with John Ringo as a collaboration. And that one really, as I said, at the time when I moved on. That's, that's been, that was for John. That was more that was John's baby. Um, so, um, yes. And now I was a Monster Hunter International novel, so it's Monster Hunting for Fun and Profit back in the 1980s. That was about it. All right. So we've heard quite a range here, and now I'm, we're going to rotate the same in direction. Except this time I'm going to ask you to explain in a little more depth why you chose to write about that, why you thought it would be a good book. What, what made you put several months of your life into that topic and what there is there about you that's reflected in it, perhaps? You want to start on the end? Okay. Well, I started writing On Earth State and the series that came after it, mainly because I wanted, I wanted Dracula back. Because every time I saw something with vampires, it's, okay, we're going to remove uh, crosses and holy water. We're going to remove silver as well as, you know, analogy for vampires. And after a while, it just, oh, please, stop it. Do these work? Mm -hmm. uh, the tagline on the front of my book is, Welcome to New York City. Vampires do not sparkle. They burn. <laughs> I think I may have stolen that line from Larry. I'm not certain. No, no, no. Larry's line was, they only sparkle when they're covered in napalm. <laughs> but, um, and I went about going, I, I, I wound up applying a lot of Thomistic philosophy to explain how vampires work because I decided to recast it as an imperfect resurrection where the soul and the body are tighter knit together so uh, of course they can have perfect control over their bodies. They can reshape their bodies into bats or mist. And then I decided to go, all right, fine, well, it, it, unless they're going to be zombies with fangs, which I don't like zombies, I find them boring. Um, if they have souls, and I figure 90% of the population, if they're given superpowers, they're gonna go evil. So if, fine, the more actions they create, they take, they make, good or evil, makes them, A, more powerful, and shapes them along the way, which means the most powerful thing is probably a brand new vampire who is a blank slate and isn't allergic to anything. Um, was, your, was your decision to do these vampires a commercial decision or a personal quest? Or what, what inspired okay. you to write it rather than... It, it was a personal decision because, again, I wanted my original Dracula back. I found some problems in the original mythos that didn't quite make sense, so I tried to fill in the gaps. And then, since I also got a, history, a history degree or two, um, I decided, okay, now we go back through time and we add vampires, which is why one of my vampires gets to work with the CIA. I could make several observations about that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. Thank you. The, what happened with the Atlantis Grail series is um, I've always been fascinated with the whole idea of the ancient alien theory. With what's actually the origin of humankind? What what is this about? How did we come about? Was it just evolution, as the straight scientific theory goes, or maybe we were seeded on this planet? But what I wanted also to do is include a rollicking classic science fiction adventure. 
which has things like um, a great big game. Think of the Hunger Games on steroids. With you, I can't even get it. It's called the Games of the Atlantis Square, which is played on Atlantis, a colony planet. Now, this is book three, and that's what this handles. Before we get to Atlantis, we have to have a good reason for <coughs> Earth being in danger. It's a huge asteroid on the collision course, and these aliens are here to help us. Who are these aliens? They tell us they're our ancestors. They are a separate, a separately evolved branch of humanity that escaped at the time of Atlantis approximately 12,000 years ago, and they've gone off for mysterious reasons which we will be revealed. But uh, so far, the kids, the, uh, there's a range of people who are to be saved because the, there is a special reason why the Atlantis can't just pick up everybody. They have 2,000 ships, huge giant arc ships they brought. They sit in the skies over everywhere on the planet. And that's the first book. It's called Qualify. Because people have to qualify to be saved. So what we have is um, kids in schools. The book begins from the point of view of a young girl. She's a nerd, completely, really unathletic, insecure, and she's the main character. And you get the story told, uh, and one thing I do not do with my character is I do not make her into this warrior woman who goes and suddenly changes and starts to you know, beat everybody in the games. This girl solves problems. She solves puzzles. She, she uses her brain. And basically, things that are out of the box is how she solves. Um, and how she basically goes through the process of qualification. Um, her family, she has three, three siblings, so everybody's in this together. It begins like a kind of a high school thing. You think it's a young adult novel, but it changes. So that's why I call it cross genre. So it starts out from a young adult perspective. Then they end up on the art ships in the second book. And the journey through space as they go through every Every single orbital area of each planet in the solar system slowly is described in as much scientific details as, like, as I think I can. Right. I, have, I have a kind of friend who's actually uh, one of the people who works in the International Space Station program, so I, I got his advice. Thank you. Uh, so our, we'll talk more about this. We'll get to it. Uh, which one of the three? <laughs> the last <laughs> one. The last one. The, the series started with the idea that actually I, I like zombies, I love The Walking Dead, and a bunch of the other media that's been done on it. But the problem is, I also like science, and zombies and science don't get along well together. Uh, and then I read, uh, I was introduced to Black Tide Rising from John Ringo, and that gave me some ideas. And I read another book by a man named uh, J.L. Bourne called Day by Day Armageddon. And I kind of had it, then I finished that, that made the idea salient. And I said, well, what if it's just simply a, an alien plague? It's been, Spanning across the galaxy, and now it's come home to roost for us. It also has a side effect of explaining why there's nobody out there talking to us because they're all freaking zombies. And um, I went with that board in a conscientious way, so I, I studied it well, and it, put, it came together with a really good story. And I realized after I finished the first one, it's going to have to be three. So the first one was that one minute and good nomination, and now this one. Uh, and the reason I did it was because my editors, my publisher said, my other books weren't selling. And I was really sad about it. What do you do? He says, write something else. Zombies is what came up to be. It turned out to be a good move because it's my first bestseller. Okay. Thank you. Um, so for me, uh, I go to the time that Joseph Files had just come out and was starting to take off. It was my introduction to Urban Fantasy. By the time I decided I was going to become a writer, uh, Mr. Korea had already published a couple of Monster Hunter International, which is the second Urban Fantasy I came into. And I realized I generally love this genre with monsters and makes magic. And I also grew up watching Wong Lee, the whole three months of it. And I decided to just combine them all and try my hand with the genre. It was completely personal. I love monsters and magic. Gotcha. Uh, Colonel retired John Brazy of the US Marine Corps. Why do you write books about the Marines? About <laughs> <laughs> that for a second. Uh, <laughs> stole my thunder. Uh, I had written. Uh, Actually, my first book was not, no, actually, my first book was a straight military uh, fiction. And I wrote it when I was in Iraq because if I went out jogging, um, I'd probably get shot. So it was a good reason for me to actually sit down and write that novel. Uh, and that was 35 years after I had first published my, my first effort was a short story. And then I was doing 35 years of long fiction until I wrote that novel. Uh, I moved into 
space marines and that type of thing because I love science fiction. And after that, I've written in, in various genres, but my readers are buying mostly the military fiction and the military science fiction. Uh, my biggest, my big series that really took off was the United Federation Marine Corps, which I've got four series in that universe. And they covered the typical discipline, loyalty, uh, what do people do when they're faced with danger, and I, and I enjoy that, that's what the genre is supposed to be. But I wanted something deeper. And I talked with a, an African-American soldier, well, he wasn't a soldier anymore, he was a soldier during World War II. And he was telling me of some of the things that he faced uh, being a black man in a white army. And that kind of hit a nerve with me. And then I started researching the Montefort Point Marines, which of course I knew about. Uh, but I was able to interview some of them. I was reading the books and I said, I've got to have something a little bit deeper. And not just bang, bang, we're good soldiers and we've got good discipline. And so the whole thing about this whole series covers uh, social issues such as integration. And it's probably been my best received book. Um, it's selling as well as any other, but my reviews and everything else. And it got me a nomination here. Much to my surprise, the book came out in April, so I was really surprised when I got that email. One of the latest in the group, yeah. To say, hey, I said, I mean, wait a minute, I don't know, I'm not coming this year. Yes, you did. And I thought, it was, I thought it was talking about what panels I wanted to be on. And then I realized, so I realized that, oh my what? Uh, okay, I guess I'm coming. But that was the reason, I just wanted something deeper than, than what I was writing before. Great, thank you. Yes, so my story is probably, if anybody here is an author, you know exactly how it happens. It started as a piece of flash fiction that wouldn't leave me alone. And I just got more and more curious about how certain things happen and why did this character do this thing and another character did another thing. And I just kept writing. Um, until I had something to show to a friend of mine who said there might be a novel in there. And I said, Do you know the writer? Or now. You are now, yes. Um, as to why I chose to write in the genre, it's um, very predictable. I grew up in the Soviet Union, so this story is kind of my whole class. Actually, that point I'd already written a whole bunch of different books and different genres. 
but um, I was writing a Monster Hunter novel at the time, actually, and I always write for musical soundtracks. And I was listening to the soundtrack from the movie Inception, and there's a song called Waiting for a Train. And I'm listening to it, and it's like a seven minute long song that builds up this massive crescendo. And it just, this song caught me so much. I hadn't even seen the movie yet, so I had no preconceived notions of, of what this was for. So I sat down, and then it was in my head, so I thought, you know what, I'm gonna write a little uh, short vignette of uh, writing the scene of what this <laughs> is about. And so it turned into what was the knife fight uh, dinner party scene from uh, Son of Black Sword. Except I wrote this little scene, and I'm like, oh, it's really good. But I, this means that I think I should make this into a novel. I should make this an epic fantasy novel, but we need to take place in a world with really brutal caste systems where, where some people are basically property and other people have status, and there's like, you know, one group is like warriors. And so I started thinking, well, and so I, I went back to the history of India kind of for inspiration. And I, I went from that and spiraled completely out of control. And I, book two comes out in February, and um, 35,000 words is book three. And it's been really popular and well received. Uh, and it's actually the first book in my relatively, well, I guess, apparently long career now. <laughs> where, uh, it's the first book I've had where uh, I've actually got critical acclaim. I didn't know what to do with that. I had never gotten positive reviews before in my life from critics. <laughs> so I started getting positive reviews for this. I'm like, wait a minute, it's a trap. That's a review from Galaxy's Edge who gave you your first positive review on it. <laughs> um, there was a few before. Touch, yeah. touch, touch on the moral dilemma situation that really is what inspired you. Yeah, yeah it was really the best thing to do it to say is that the song was just the thing that gave me a vision in my head that I wanted to write a story for. Um, but really, what the what the story is about, and, and actually, I actually did the same theme in my Grimoire Chronicles. Um, where in that is, are people property of the government or is the government property of people? It's just kind of the, the fundamental theme of those books. And uh, it's the same thing where you have an all powerful thing that can give you everything, and in this case, the law. And then you have an all powerful thing that can take everything away from you if you become inconvenient. And so I threw in some demons and lost magic sword fighting. Okay. We're going to change gears now from the, the stories to the people in the process. And we'll start with John and go that way. And if everybody could just give us a couple of sentences on why you're writing and not making a lot of money except for Larry. Um, <laughs> <laughs> John's doing well too, but then you got your pension. Anyhow, <laughs> it's tough every MC knows you. It's really annoying. Anyhow, seriously. Why have you chosen writing? John, you've got a PhD in business piece. You could be, a, be working for IBM and, and wearing a gray suit every day. Why are you a writer and not with other things you might be qualified to do? Why'd you pick writing? A couple of sentences each. Simply because I love it. I've been a fan of, of reading other people and the idea of, I, I have no intention. I'm, I'm a little, I, like when I wrote that book in Iraq, I just wanted some copies to put on the wall and, and give my mother. So I went to iUniverse. I paid $470 so I could get 20 copies. I know everybody sits there, rubs their head, and says, oh my gosh, you know, why'd you do that? I just wanted 20 copies. And three years later, it, well, uh, three years in iUniverse, it paid me $98 in royalties. <laughs> but then I put it on Amazon and it took off. And then people started saying, where's the next book? Where's the next book? Where's the next book? And somehow I realized People wanted to read what I want. I'm doing it for the, okay, I'm making good money, but I don't need the money. But I like the affirmation. I like when people are, when I'm standing with George Martin and someone comes running up to us with a book in his hand and he wants my signature, not George's. <laughs> that, that's why I'm writing. <laughs> decided when I was 18, which was probably the best time to make career life decisions, <laughs> but I decided <laughs> when I, I fell in love with it, I was actually angry at, at, at this time, I don't know if you name the author, but, oh, okay, ahead. yeah, um, Ari Salvatore's book had just come out at that time where there was a time skip between Drizzt and a lot of the main characters had been killed because so many times had passed, and as an angry 18 year old, I thought that was stupid and that's not how you write good fiction and I could do better, which, <laughs> Again, 18 bad time to make decisions, and I tried writing a book. But, and I realized how quickly I was wrong, but I, I absolutely fell in love with it. Everything quickly made 
sense. And now I, I get to do conventions with guys like Larry and Jim Butcher and people who I, I literally grew up reading. So it's and Bob cool. next year, he's a reading guy. Oh, oh. <laughs> Can I have my sword? <laughs> you inspired me. <laughs> you know, I just leave it like that. In uh, 1972, I'm pretty sure, as a third grader in, uh, in grade school, I was forced to do a bookstore, a book report, and I didn't like anything I saw. I just wanted to pick up a book by a guy, just a little known writer you might have heard of, called Robert A. Heinlein, <laughs> called The Rolling Stones. And my entire universe was turned upside down. It was my very first science fiction. I hated reading until then. I read science fiction, and it's like something clicked. And from that moment on, I told everybody who would listen to me that I would be a science fiction writer. I would be a writer, actually, that would fall into science fiction. And uh, so, what was it? 45 years later, here I am. Uh, I, made it my, I made it my goal through my life, too, and I've worked for it ceaselessly now for 12 years, pretty much at lunch at work, after work, long evenings, you name it. Every day I wrote. And uh, six months ago, I quit my day job. Well, I guess I started when I discovered that language was a good, that English language was a wonderful good thing. Because you know what? Um, what's the chance of having two women from the Soviet Union on one panel? Uh, I was a refugee from the Soviet Union back in 1975. Um, then I was a refugee from the war in Lebanon. And we back and I was living only in Russian and Armenian, which I am. Um, and then I came to America. And I discovered that there's this thing called English, and it's wonderful for writing. So I began to write. I got my first uh, story sold by uh, uh, to Mary Azimuth Sword and Sorceress in 1985, and I was a high schooler. And since then, it's been short stories, magazines, novels. Um, but I haven't really been making any money. I was like an impoverished, starving writer for ages, and working as a tech support person and a computer geek. Well, when I started writing this series, um, I made more money last year than I made in any <laughs> computer tech job. And it's still not a lot, but uh, yeah. And uh, this series, The Atlantis Blue, has just been optioned for a major motion picture uh, franchise. So. <laughs> okay. um, when I was 16, I made the mistake of trying fan fiction, uh, writing it, not reading it. Um, and. I figured, okay, I'm just going to take this idea, I'm going to doodle around with it a little bit. Um, let me see, four novels, uh, it was about 1,200 pages of single-spaced print later. Um, I found that I was addicted to it. Uh, I really, I write because I have to now, because, okay, I refer to uh, writing, being an author, as legalized schizophrenia. <laughs> so uh, please do not take me away when I say the voices won't go away unless you write them down. Um, okay, it's no, it, it's seriously. I have ideas. They have. To, I have to put them down, or they don't go away. So I have to write. Um, trust me. If I had an option, I'd probably be a plumber. Uh, but no, I, I I have to, and I'm just glad that people like. Doctor Asimov. Loved to write. Dr. Asimov could not stop. Dr. Asimov was sent to the Catskills by his physician, stripped of all refreshed resource material, and put in a cabin in a resort in the mountains. Three days later, the typewriter disappeared. <laughs> Six weeks later, the humor of Dr. Asimov was delivered to his publisher at Valentine. <laughs> yeah, we can't stop. <laughs> Marina? <laughs> yeah, I'm an accountant. Um, most of my co-workers don't know that I am a writer. Oh, really? Yeah. Um, Everybody I know found out my first book. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a writer. I'm a writer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How many friends that don't work that way? Yeah. My husband <laughs> found out when a book of proofs arrived at the house and said, can you look at this? <laughs> yeah, this is my proof. <laughs> Thank you. 
attendance? Um, it's kind of funny. I, I got into it motivated by spite, ironically enough. Uh, I've always been a storyteller, and I've always loved to read, and I've always loved sci-fi and fantasy. And I kind of always wanted to do it. And my, my very first book I tried to write was in college, but it was terrible. I didn't know what I was doing. It was a thriller. You'll never see it. It's crap. Um, but one night, about 10 years after that, I was laying in bed, and I was reading this book. And it was the number one New York Times bestseller, most popular book in the world at the time. And, uh, they were making it into a big movie, and I read it, and it sucked. But it was so terrible. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this, this predates the anchor. Okay. I read it, and I was like, yeah, this is horrible. As I looked at my wife, and I said, look at this guy, he can write this book. Well, actually, I, then I got a couple more of his books, because he was so popular. I thought, surely this one was just a, a fluke. And I read a couple more of his books, they were just as bad or worse. There's a couple of good lines, but overall, it's terrible. So he I thought, was 50 Shades of Grey, wasn't he? So what? 50 Shades of Grey? Actually, I can't say who it is, because I've met him at the head since. He's a really nice guy. Yo. And he's, a, he's, a, he's, a, he's an elder statesman, and I won't say that. But um, so I start reading this, and uh, I go to my wife, and I said, hey, "Honey, if this guy can be the number one most successful author in the world, sure, I can at least get published." And she's like, "Whatever, dude." And uh, <laughs> so I was very sweet. As long as we see him making the mortgage payments. Right? Yeah, I have so well, I'm, and they've gotten pretty big now. And so my second, uh, my second book or, that I tried to write was Monster Hunter, and, uh, and, and, and you know that that's done pretty good. It took off, and. Uh, so it was entirely out of spite because I thought, surely if this guy can can be the best, then I can at least get published and work out a little bit better. Uh, once more, changing gears to let people know both about you and the process. In a sentence or two, in a sentence or two, describe your journey. Telling us to make a sentence or two, we're blind. Yeah, writers. we're nine writers. <laughs> <laughs> Nine, nine writers. Is that, I, I, I write fiction too, remember? So my routine now is I'll, I'll get up and uh, 
get something to eat, and I'll mess around on the computer a little bit and see uh, see who's wrong on Facebook that I have to correct. <laughs> and after I finish that mission, uh, I will, I'll find myself starting to drift into the area that I create. And, uh, the thing is, I've discovered is uh, I'm not a night person. I'm a freaking vampire. Because my best writing is between 1 a.m. and 5 a.m. You know, my wife's dead asleep, and I come stumbling into the bedroom and oh, fall in the bed, and then I wake up <laughs> around noon or so, I wake up and do it all again. I think I do the same thing. I, I write all through the night, and I go through the day, but I do long stretches. It's like a burst, and kind of like a way to just fill up with blood and needle punch. <laughs> so I let all the writing out, and I come back, maybe I do research for a day or two, and then I get in a write in the middle of the night, and people think, why are you up again? Why, what is going on? And it's like, well, this is my work time. So night owl, vampire, whatever you want to call it. Is the guy who only can't stop writing about vampires says he has to write at night, I'm going to count on No, I don't have to write at night. Uh, I roll out of bed. I write from 9 to 5. Um, I will occasionally remember to eat somewhere in the middle. Um, cook dinner for myself and my wife. Um, married a whole eight days. And they said, <laughs> I'm smart at 9, 10 o'clock. I'll go to bed or I'll play video games or I'll read a book. If I'm not smart, I'll go back down to the computer. I'll write until I'm, you know, the words kind of start blurring um, and then fall over into bed. Um, that's usually, those are usually the days where the next day I read what I wrote and went, what did I mean to say? Because this sentence makes no sense. Their words are, the words are fine. They're in a bad order, but uh, that's my process. I, you have to approach it like a nine to five, at least I do. Does anybody else have to point down to you? I mean, something for half an hour or so, you stop the words from moving out. The day you show and the, uh, exactly. the previous day is set in my hands. I think you picked it. I will add that February 20th, I'm expecting twins, so I expect my schedule will be adjusted.
I can't tell you how many people have come up to me and say, why do I write? I've got this book. I've been thinking about it for 10 years. Well, what have you done for it? I'm, I'm going to start. Just do it. Just start. Uh, so this is going to be a bit awkward again for me because I have the same advice that Mr. Korea did, and he parroted that advice when I started, as did Jim Butcher. Uh, I think we both told that to you in the same conversation. Yes. <laughs> um, uh, I am in a very situation where the writers I look up to and look up to others have been mentoring. Um, so with that, I would just say um, be consistent in writing. It, it's harder, obviously, but don't make it a daily thing if you can't, but always try to be progressing you're writing in some way. Feel like you should write. 
for me, um, it's an alternate World War One set of uh, urban fantasy. So I want to mess with alternate history and go, what happened if there was urban fantasy people during World War One? And there's a lot of great things that go on around here. There were guys who think they saw horrors in the trenches, and like there's a lot of mythology that's coming up from them about trench monsters. And I just want to play with that and see what happens and make it a massive BB, 300,000 words standing on. 300,000. As an editor, have I pointed out you can do two books in that one? You can make more money, right, no. Larry? No. <laughs> three books. <laughs> three books. Well, yeah, well, well, John, I mean, it's just a kid. I'm actually, I've actually agreed to write a game, uh, which is going to be interesting, uh, but that's going to be based on one of my universes. Uh, the next non that I'm not work that I'm working on right now uh, is sort of my my flowers for Algernon in the future in the military, uh, with sort of like David Grimm's uplifted uplift series, but in my own darker way.
and you have to have very, it's basically politics gone nuts, and completely isolation is wrong. And so what I want to do with that is, I already said I have a, a prequel short story for that, and it's going to be a trilogy um, called Pantheon, and, and the one of them is, um, I have a person who is, um, it's Italy in the future, it's near the future, and this woman is basically a, a source woman, because all weapons that are um, long range have been outlawed in that honeycomb cell. So they only use steel, swords, knives, daggers. So she happens to be uh, able to travel by permission of the government to other countries. And books are going to have other countries. For example, we'll have Russia, which is uh, intimate knowledge of it. <laughs> and um, we'll have other you know, visions of America in that kind of situation. That's something I would love to get to eventually. Why am I under the impression we're not going to get a lot of Russian comedies translated? I think the text Russians always be dark. That's the dark. dystopian. So some dark, dark, dark. 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 I don't know why. Like All right. All right. We have to do a Russian fairy tale, uh, uh, Red Blue, or it's a Russian based fantasy series right now with Steve Diamond collaborating. And it's like this dark fairy tale magic world. Don't be able to smile. Yeah. I'm starting to understand. No, I'm